Good morning and welcome to our service this morning. Another beautiful day, isn't it? I often say we ought to have vines in there. We, we can grow grapes and tomatoes. We have been since, since the church was built, I think. But anyway, welcome this morning. Um, there aren't any, any notices, so I'll hand you straight over to Terry, who's going to lead us in our worship this morning. Thank you, Terry. Pardon? Oh, yes, that's the, there is one notice. That there's a gardening day. It's Friday the 24th of September, is it? There's a notice outside anyway, so the more that can come, the easier it'll be for everybody else. So get your gardening gloves out and it, have, have a nice time. I know there's plenty of gardeners amongst you, aren't there? Yeah, yeah, I know more. I know Maureen enjoys her gardening. It's harvest next Sunday, yeah. You want flowers? Okay, well, next Saturday... Is between 10 and 12 you're going to be decorating the church and it's harvest next Sunday so, um, and, and the harvest produce is going to uh, the Burntwood Beer Friend Community Store which I'm going to tell you a little bit about in a few minutes time so I'll hand over to Terry We come together in worship both those of us here in church and those joined with us on Zoom our call to worship. Living Christ, you who turned upside down our understanding of who is chosen by God, you who continually inspire people to live God's way, be present in our time of worship. Holy Spirit, you who bring life and creativity, you who en energize our service to God and others, be present in our worship. Loving God, you who are the depth and height in whom we find our true identity as your children, be present in our worship. Amen. We sing our first hymn, it's number 20 in from Singing the Faith. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. you in words that are often inadequate to describe even a fraction of your being for our human terms and our limited understanding sometimes Lord fails to grasp the full nature of the Godhead 
we come, holy God, seeking to know you and to see you, even as we recognize that until we truly see you face to face, our understanding remains limited. All-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving God, we praise you for those things that we do know of you, of your presence among your people, particularly your presence in Jesus our Saviour, your Word made incarnate. We praise you, Lord, how you make yourself known to us through other people. You made yourself known, Scripture tells us, to a man, Abraham, and then to a people, the people of Israel, and then through Jesus to all those who would come to him and own his name, recognizing him as your word, your son. Lord, accept the praise we offer. Lord, who do we say that Christ is? Forgive us, Lord, when at times perhaps we don't truly understand how you came among us. Forgive us, Christ, if we put you in the category of a pop star or a TV personality and make you into a kind of celebrity when you, Lord, would rather be seen by us as a suffering servant. Forgive us, Lord, if we see you as some kind of national hero, perhaps a Churchill or other kind of hero, and build you up, as it were, as a monument when you see yourselves as, yourself as a mocked and rejected Messiah. Christ, sometimes we find it hard to understand. Sometimes we find your words and wisdom hard to follow. Sometimes we don't understand your way of choosing those whom the world rejects to be part of your kingdom. Lord, forgive us and give us that challenge anew to serve you without exception, to be willing to share your love without restriction. Lord, give us wisdom to truly see you, the faith to truly follow, and the courage to carry your cross as we follow in your name. And Lord, we recall that prayer that you first taught your disciples the prayer we know is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We come now to our second hymn, number 565, in Singing the Faith. Only by grace can we enter.
cleansed for your grace, we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, if you mark our transgressions, who would stand? Thanks to your grace, we are cleansed by the blood of the The first reading is from the book of James and it's from chapter 3 and it's verses 1 to 12 and it's entitled The Taming of the Tongue. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When he puts bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take the ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on by fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed, and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Amen. Our second reading is from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. 
What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Amen. of each of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight Lord our Redeemer Amen do you have a double now I suppose if you're an identical twin then yes you probably do have a double that's probably taken as red but do you have somebody who looks like you do you find yourself in the situation where you meet someone who thinks they know you and you just haven't a clue who they are at all and they insist that they met you on such and such an occasion? In fact, you know, that they're so sure that it was you and it takes some convincing to get them to sort of uh, actually accept grudgingly that you're not the person that they met before. Slightly worrying, actually, if people can actually mistake you for somebody else, particularly if the people that they're mistaking you for is a criminal, <laughs> and they go out and commit a crime, and the witnesses all insist that they saw you do the crime. So at least I have an alibi for this coming, this hour. So if anybody asks you, where was I on the 12th of September between 11 and 12, at least I hopefully have some, uh, some alibi there. It can all be actually be quite disconcerting at times, particularly when people insist you are this particular person. A few years ago now, I was at a welcome service in the circuit, I think it was at Salem Church, and I, I, I'd done a reading in the service, and after the service, this, a woman approached me, she was the wife of one of the civic dignitaries who'd been there at the service, and she was saying that, you know, she's sure she, she knew me, and she in fact decided that I was the VAT inspector who did her husband's company's VAT or uh, you know, ch ch checks and so on. In the end, we eventually realized that we had actually, or, well, I, I still couldn't recall her face, but we had actually realized the link that she was a magistrate and she'd been a magistrate in court when I'd been there as a family court advisor. Although I have to say, I couldn't remember seeing her before. Perhaps that's my poor memory. But identity is important. Who people say we are is important. And Jesus in our gospel reading that Beryl read to us seems to start off with him as he were almost doing a kind of consumer survey on his identity. Perhaps he thought that the disciples initially wouldn't be so brave, brave as to actually say who they thought he was. So to start with, he asked them, who other people say that they are. Perhaps, a, perhaps an easier question to ask because you, know, you, you can say, well, all kinds of things that somebody else says, but deny that's how you feel. It's interesting that the answers they give to his first question are answers that look to the past. They look to the past for clues as to who Jesus was. Some thought he was John the Baptist who had who started his preaching before Jesus. You know, perhaps they'd heard some of John's preaching, and perhaps they saw similarities between him and Jesus. There were others, though, who thought he had links even further back. There were some who thought he was the prophet Elijah. The prophet Elijah, according to Kings, to, sorry, the second book of Kings, tells us that Elijah didn't die in the normal sense, but was taken up to God in heaven. And at the end of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi, it's prophesied that Elijah would return as, a, as a, a herald, as it were, to prepare the way for God's Messiah. Some were a bit more vague. They thought he may have been just some other Old Testament prophet. And then Jesus asked that second question, the more direct one, perhaps the more difficult one. But what about you? 
What about you? Who do you say that I am? The disciples would have had a number of things to draw on, I suppose, in making that assessment. They had spent time with Jesus. They'd heard him preach. They'd seen him heal. They'd spent time in fellowship. That would have given them you know, some idea as they traveled with him. As Jews, they would have been aware of Jewish scripture. They'd have been aware of the various prophecies that concerned the Messiah. And although those prophecies didn't give a consistent view, you know, some talked of the suffering servant, others rather of a Messiah who would come like David, more of a military leader to drive out their enemies. But there were those different understandings. But whatever their thoughts, it's Simon Peter who answers first. Simon, of course, who's usually the spokesman of the group, although also usually the one who gets his you know, foot in his mouth by saying the wrong thing. On this occasion, though, he answers simply, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. The Christ, the Messiah. The Christ, the one sent by God. What can we take from that passage, I wonder, when we consider perhaps our own identity and that of others? I suppose one lesson that can be drawn from how Simon answered is that it's important to have a clear sense of your own identity. I'm sure that Jesus, when he asked these questions of the disciples, wasn't asking them because he didn't know the answer. He didn't need to be told you know, who he was. He was, would have been quite sure, quite clear about who he was. But he asked them to get a sense of their understanding. At one point in his ministry, we hear how the mother and brothers of Jesus sought Jesus out to encourage him to go back home. Perhaps they were concerned for his safety because of the opposition he was meeting. Perhaps they were concerned about the scandal he was creating, this carpenter's son, trying to be a rabbi. Perhaps it was some kind of intervention. They feel he'd got mixed up with the wrong sort. You know, these fishermen, who are they? Who are they? You know, perhaps you know, we need to put him back on the right path. But of course, Jesus, when he answers them, makes it clear that he knows who he is. He knows the path he's on. He knows where he's going. He's secure enough not to be undermined by even the disciples when they misunderstand and get it wrong. He's not to be undermined by his family either in that way. For, for Jesus, his identity would have been strong, secure. For all of us, of course, our identity is central to who we are. And it's usually more than just personal, in a sense, because we live in a context of relationships. We live alongside other people. I don't know if you've ever done the exercise, perhaps on some kind of course, where you're asked to list all the words that would describe the various roles that you have. You know, some of them are easy to think of being a son or daughter, being a father or a mother or a husband or a wife. But we can add to that list perhaps various jobs that we have. They can be voluntary roles as much as paid occupation. They can be positions that other people see us in, roles that other people see us fulfill. And if you give it some thought, you can end up with quite a list of words that describe the person that you are. They show, as it were, what you identify with. It can be also, I think, associations or groups that you're a, a member of. You know, the local pigeon fanciers club, perhaps. The football team. Or the church fellowship and community. It's good to have those identities. It's good to be secure in them. The problem comes, though, at times when seeing ourselves as belonging to one group 
means that we don't see ourselves as part of another group. And the danger then is that if we, as it were, support one team, we support the Reds. Then we think those who are supporting the blue team are lesser in some way. They've got it wrong. You know, they're a different kind of group and community. They're in some way less than us. We have to be careful that being secure in our own identity doesn't deny other people theirs. We know that the mass media, perhaps particularly the printed media, are very good at um, sort of building people up, building people up as celebrities, making them seem important. Uh, when we were out just in the foyer earlier on, uh, you know, people weren't talking about the tennis match last night and how the, this young British talent has suddenly you know, come to prominence. And, and somebody mentioned you know, the risk, the risk that when you get built up, then you have to start to deal with that fame. And sometimes, actually, the media aren't very good at helping people deal with fame that they're not used to. And I'm sure we can think of lots of examples of people who, having been built up, then sudden, you know, just as quickly find themselves knocked down when situations change, or perhaps people can't do quite as well as we did in the past. Our other reading from the epistle to James reminded us that we need to be very careful about what we say about other people. It talked about the damage that the tongue can do if used unwisely. Now, I'm sure that all of us here uh, are far too old to personally recall the wartime posters. You know, the wartime posters advising careless talk costs lives. That was in the context, of course, of wartime and of being careful that you know, there could be enemy spies around. And perhaps if you worked in you know, munitions or you know, so, some other important industry then, you know, if you said too much to one of your friends, well, one, you, won't, you know, might not be confident about your friend, but other people might actually be listening out to what you might say. And James talks about how careless talk can damage the life of the community of faith. Perhaps that was why he was writing to that particular community through James. Perhaps the idea, important thing there was that people needed to learn to be careful what they said to one another and what they said about one another. For Peter and the other disciples who were with Jesus near Caesarea Philippi that day. It was important that they, as it were, perhaps, started to sort out in their minds who it was they'd been following, having spent a period of time with him by then, hearing him, seeing him, talking with him. And perhaps if it had stopped there, that would have felt quite good for the disciples. Yes, Jesus, our Lord, he is the Messiah, the one sent by God. You know, everything's going to be great because we have God's Son with us. But then Jesus, of course, doesn't leave it there because he then explains to them at the heart of the Messiah's mission, his sort of victory in the conventional sense, but at the heart of his mission will be his suffering and will be his death. And they find it difficult to grasp that, don't they? They have difficulty with that concept. They think perhaps they've got to the point with Jesus where they understand it and they understand what's expected of them. And then Jesus says, well, no. You've now got to understand what my being the Messiah and what you being my followers really means. The way of Jesus, the way of his passion, the way of his servant is the way also that his followers are going to have to tread. To save our lives, we must be prepared to offer them for his sake. The way of the disciples should follow and be shaped by Jesus' identity. Going back to posters and thinking of a more recent poster, 
You may have seen the one over the years that says if you were charged with being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And if you were taken to court to be charged to be a, as a the crime of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to actually justify that? That's a challenging question. It's a challenging question because what is the evidence? You know, what evidence do we provide to other people? How can people tell when they meet us? How can people tell when they share time with us? that we are those who seek to be in the image and in the way of Jesus. Jesus asks all of us that question that he asked the disciples, that second question. Who do you say that I am? It's something that we respond to individually, but it's something that we also respond to corporately as part of his church. How do we answer that? Perhaps our next hymn gives us the answer we should make. He is Lord, he is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Let that, let that be our answer to the, how we see Jesus. Thank you, Mike. with us about, well, some, something, something that we can respond to ne hopefully next week as part of our harvest service. Thank you, Terry. Um, as I said in the beginning, the produce from the harvest this year is going to the Burn to Be a Friends community store. And I'd like to thank you for that in advance and hope that we'll have plenty of tinned, bottled cartons, packets, and all that sort of thing. If you want to bring some fresh, we do take fresh as well. The idea of the community store is actually based upon the pantries. I don't know if you've heard of the pantries idea. Uh, they are all over the country, um, but they're normally um, franchises where you, you have a business in a box. But Burn to Be a Friend decided to 
to, to be an independent community store, of which there's, there's a lot in the country as well. We um, access a lot of our stuff from a, an organization called Fair Share. I don't know if you've heard of Fair Share. It's an organization which buys products from supermarkets that are within their best before date, but which have either they've over ordered, you know, they've got too many, or they're too close to their best before, or they use by date for them to be able to sell. And if they don't do anything with them, all these products end up in landfill. So we're taking a lot, a huge quantities out of landfill, tons, thousands of tons of stuff out of landfill. Then to be a friend, pay an annual subscription to Fair Share for their share of all these, all this excess food, if you like, tin goods, um, fresh meat, um, anything you can think of, we can have in the community store. We don't always know what we're going to get. I mean, last, last Monday when it came, we had about 20, 20 big packs of um, chicken thighs and a load of minced beef. But this week, we might have, I don't know, 10 boxes of bananas or 10 trays of coffee, that, that sort of thing. So we never know what we're going to have. Um, but all the stuff that they bring to us goes into the store in, or into the chest freezer or, in, or into the chiller. For some time before we handed back management of the food bank to churches together in Burntwood, we felt that we were being guided very strongly by God to go on to the next step. And the idea of pantries, franchise or not, community store, was ringing a, a lot of loud bells within, the, within our little group. So we decided that we would go with it <coughs> and we opened a pilot at St Anne's Church on the 9th of August, which is only, what, four, five, five, six weeks ago now. And we offer a range of goods from breakfast cereals, lunch and dinner items to tin, fruit, pop, squash, anything you can think of, we, we can store there. And for as little as five pound, customers can come and choose 12 items from the, from the shelves. For, fifth, for 10 pound, they can choose up to 15 different items. I know that's only three different on the shelves, but with a 10 pound bag, you have more access to what's in the fridge, what's in the freezer. So that's where, the, uh, where it sort of evens itself out. But as I say, we don't know what's going to be available. So it's everything, <coughs> it's, uh, excuse me, everything again is subject to availability. And we've also got a tent out on the front of St Anne's Church. I don't know if any of you have been up by St Anne's lately, but there's been a big white uh, gala tent up there for 18 months or so. And uh, we have the fresh produce in there, you know, bread, fruit, veg, all that sort of stuff. And that comes within the five pound bag and the 10 pound bag. You also get a personal shopper who will take you around the shop and points out how many items you can have from each of the different uh, sections. We've got it laid out as breakfast, lunch and dinner, pudding, miscellaneous toiletries and all that sort of thing. We've also got a free from section. So we're trying to cover vegan, vegetarian, gluten free. Uh, we haven't got any diabetic at the moment. So hopefully, you know, Fair Share might bring us some stuff from time to time. We can't guarantee what's available because it's dependent on what we receive from Fair Share and from churches and from individual items. But um, if we've got it, you can have it. You know, it, it's there. And it's open to everybody, irrespective of income. So everyone in this room and everyone on Zoom could come tomorrow to St. John, to, sorry, to St. Anne's and actually sign up and become a member if you want to. I've signed up and so have most of the volunteers, I think. From our experience of running the food bank on the car park at the back of Emmanuel Church over the last 18 months, we found that so many people who were coming were upset, embarrassed, ashamed even, at having to ask for help. We interview every single person <coughs> that comes. And some of the stories we've heard have been absolutely heartbreaking. They really have to know that there's such a need in the Burntwood area. There's such poverty in the Burntwood area. I mean, my eyes have been on stalks for the last 18 months because I just haven't believed the amount of poverty that's, that's around here. People who've never 
asked for help before have come and they've been in tears. Grown men have been in tears. We've heard so many heartbreaking stories from people in need. And really, it's, it's broken our hearts at times. We, we've joined in the tears with the people who've come. They were able to pay for some food, but, they, but not enough to see them through the week. And some of them were even going without eating every day. And in the 21st century, that's, that's absolutely deplorable. We're talking about families who are on the breadline. Young mums unable to cope on their benefits for one reason or another, either because the benefits didn't cover the essentials or they were in arrears with their rent or they were paying back loans to social services and the like. And with everywhere closed down, food bank was their only help, their only hope in those circumstances. Some of the clients were elderly and were mortified at having to ask for help and it had taken them weeks to pluck up courage to come and say, I could do with a hand, can you help me? Others were business owners whose businesses had gone bust because of the pandemic, and so many others were on furlough. So the aim of the, of the community store is to restore dignity, which is so important to people, restore hope, to promote healthy eating, choice, Rather than me give someone a tin of baked beans and say, this is what you're going to have for your tea tonight, they can choose to take a tin of beans off those shelves themselves and decide, yeah, I'm going to have beans on toast tonight, rather than me saying, this is what's in your bag and this is what you're having. We want to restore self-reliance. People do like to pay. They really do like to pay for things. People see it shameful that they're given two or three bags of groceries and a bag of fresh stuff. But restoring dignity, I think, is one of the most important things that we can do for people. I know when David, some years ago when David was on short time, it, it was terrible not being able to choose what we wanted to eat, having to rely on other people, and there weren't food banks then. So we piloted the shop on the 9th of August at St. Chats, at, at St. Anne's, and we're open on a Monday between 10 and 1, and it's been very, very popular. Everyone who said has come how good the choice is, how good uh, the freshness and all that sort of thing, and they've been delighted with the numbers of items they can buy for their five or 10 pounds. And many of them return for a second and third visit, and they've actually brought other people with them. And as of last Monday, we've got 44 members, which in five weeks, I think is pretty good going. We're open to everyone in the Burntwood area and within a three mile radius, and everyone is welcome, irrespective of income. We don't offer a full shop because that would be impossible, we just haven't got the premises, but we offer a supplement, things to keep people going from week to week. At the moment, we're only open once a week, but we're hoping to move to a more permanent site in a few months' time, and then we're going to be hopefully opening uh, two or three times a week for up to so sort of between 10 and 2, that sort of thing and hopefully even uh, one evening a week for people who are perhaps just work a couple of days a week and they can pop in and just buy a few odds and ends. When we do move though, this means that we're going to have to pay out for rent, electricity, running costs, buy equipment and stock. But all the money that we're getting in will go straight back into the shop. It'll be completely non-profit and it's run by uh, volunteers. It's run by volunteers from Burntwood for the community of Burntwood. If any of you would like to come around and have a look at the shop, I'll be very happy to, to take you around and be your personal shopper. Um, if you want to know any more about it, just, just uh, call me after, after, the, after the service. But the community store is just one of the many fields that Burntwood Be A Friend are involved with. We offer help to vulnerable people, to vulnerable families, debt management, mental health help, free school uniforms. We've even got a most fantastic baby bank up at um, Spring Hill Academy. And they get everything, brand new stuff, used stuff, you name it. And in this porter cabin is stacked high with, with stuff for babies. All the volunteers have been DBS checked. We've all got food hygiene certificates. We've done safeguarding and we've done a, a lot of training. So it's all run by volunteers for the people of Burnswood. And again, if you'd like to volunteer, 
you'll be more than welcome. If you want to come and have a look, you'll be more than welcome. And um, I think that's about it. So I'm hoping for a bumper harvest next week. Please. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Linda. Thank you, Linda. We turn again to God in prayer. At the end of each section of these prayers, to the words, Lord, in your mercy, please join in the response. Hear our prayer. Lord, so many people in our world today seem to be living in situations of difficulty, situations of risk. We think particularly at this time of those who, in Afghanistan, are dealing with the uncertain consequences of the takeover by the Taliban there. We think particularly, Lord, perhaps of those who we have seen even willing to go onto the streets to protest about the route, this rule. And it's difficult, Lord, perhaps for any of us here to comprehend how frightening and disorientating it must be for the Afghan people living with such a rapidly changing reality. And Lord, we would offer them up to you, praying for their safety. Pray for those, Lord, who show huge courage. Pray, Lord, that voices will be heard and that those who can have an influence on the new authorities there will use that influence. We'll use it particularly for the needs of those at greatest risk. Loving God, draw close to the people of Afghanistan. May we see and be inspired by those who in your name take risks for justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we have perhaps listened to some of the other news this week, we have been reminded about the cost of providing care for those who, because of ill health or increasing age, need help with their personal care. We thank you, Lord, for all those who provide care, whether it be for elderly relatives, whether it be in home settings, whether it be for those with disability. Lord, may we never devalue that role of a caregiver, echoing, Lord, your role as a servant. And Lord, as our leaders wrestle with the costs of care in the future, help us not to lose sight of the individual human lives that are deeply affected by how this care is given and how it's received. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who deeply cares for all of us. Help us to understand the full meaning of being cared for by our Creator. Loving God, draw close to all who give care. May we see and be inspired by those who give of themselves so diligently for others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we are also aware of so many people and groups fighting hard for climate justice, trying to bring to the attention of the leaders of nations the real risk to the environment, to the world, and to ourselves. We thank you, Lord, for those who are not afraid to use their voices to speak out. And we pray, Lord, for everyone who will be preparing for and then being part of the Climate Summit, COP26, to be held in Glasgow in the next month or so. We pray particularly, Lord, for young people who mobilize their families and their friends. And we thank you, Lord, for their thoughtful concern and the energy they bring to thinking about such huge and seemingly intractable issues. Lord, loving God, Draw close to all those who seek to protect the world you have made. May we see and be inspired by those, Lord, concerned of your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, many of us will 
know of examples of Christians around our world who face persecution and danger. We think, Lord, of brothers and sisters who live in countries hostile to their faith and for whom to express their faith in public is a highly provocative and potentially dangerous act. Lord, please draw near to everyone in danger today because they follow you. Loving God, draw close to all for whom discipleship is costly. May we see and be inspired by those who choose to worship whatever their circumstances. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we think of those in our own community who are in need, and Linda has been reminding us of that. Lord, whatever the circumstances that those around us face, may they come to know, Lord, that we are part of that community which cares for them. Lord, challenge us. Challenge us to become more aware of those in need and challenge us, Lord, to find ways to respond. Loving Lord, draw close to all of us this coming week as we seek to work out what discipleship with you truly means in our own lives. Lord, if we have answered the question, who do we say that you are? Help us, Lord, to also answer the question, how do we serve others in your name? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. These prayers we offer in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. We come to our closing hymn, number 489, in Singing the Faith, All I Once Held Dear.
Mike for providing our music for this morning and thank Carol for doing all the technicals there. May Almighty God give us the vision to see who we can be in his service, the wisdom to know his purposes for all, the grace to seek justice and mercy for all, and the strength to continue in his way. This we ask in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.